so we're now going to get uh, a premiership player of Collingwood up on stage. He's been mentioned already, Gav Kosiska. So just a, a little bit of a background into, into the creation of Gav's role at the club. Uh, you know, we, we identified a number of years ago uh, and uh, we initiated a survey of all the past players uh, to address, uh, you know, what they felt were, you know, um, I suppose issues with the, you know, with, with the Past Players Association in particular, but also their engagement with the club and it's a fantastic segue to talk about what Nick Maxwell's done both in helping us, you know, create Gab's role, but also in, I think, bringing a lot of the past players back into the club. And while she's spot on, you know, I know that there are a lot of players that do, they don't feel comfortable going back to the club, doesn't matter what, in, in what form that is or where it is or whether it's even going to a game or going down to the rooms or anything like that, but that's all changing slash changed. I know that Mickey Gafer and Ducky Bowick have, have, have done the same thing that Steve's doing and, and they spoke um, glowingly of that, of that experience and, and how much it felt like they've now um, sort of, if you like, returned to the club and they feel like they're back, back part of the family. So that's what we're trying to do with, you know, within reason. So, so Gav's, uh, Gav's helping us do that. You know, there's, there's a number of past players that are not connected to the club. They're that simply in, you know, we don't have their contact details. Um, some of them don't want to be contacted. Uh, Gav's doing that and, um, you know, I, I know for a fact there's a number of past players that, that certainly were in that, that third category, which is they don't want to have anything to do with the club at all. But then now they're coming into the, you know, coming into the fold and, and that's the way we view the past players is that they're, um, uh, that we're a family and that, you know, you, whilst, whilst your family member might move into state or wherever else, that they're still part of the family and you still have to look after them if you can. So that's what we're going to talk about later on with the auction. So without further ado, Gav Kassis, you're going to catch up, come up on stage and tell us a little bit about it. Thanks, Tuddy. Um, I guess good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the 8th um, Murray Wiedemann Welfare Luncheon. Um, as mentioned previously, it's to raise really important funds for, for what we're going to do and how we want to help past players uh, and the reconnection uh, of getting those guys. Uh, and inter interestingly, uh, it was exactly 8 years and 12 days ago uh, when I found myself in desperate need of some sort of support and I had nowhere to turn. Although from uh, what most people saw from the outside, um, I'd struggled for a long time with depression and anxiety, uh, and then I struggled with the drugs and alcohol that I believe I needed to, to medicate myself for me to feel okay. My marriage was hanging by a thread, uh, I was not present in my kids' lives, and I had limited relationships with people close to me. And that was because of the behaviours associated with drug and alcohol addiction. I was a sad, hopeless man enslaved by addiction, but didn't know how to live any other way. I kept my drug use very secretive because of the embarrassment, the shame of what my life had become, and those close to me were very confused with what was actually going on for me. Thankfully, my wife helped me uh, be admitted to a private hospital uh, to be treated for what she and other people around me believed was alcoholism and, and gambling, uh, but that was only part of the story. I was a broken man at the time, not knowing if I wanted to live and not knowing if I really wanted to die either. And after many years of abuse, addiction finally got me to my knees. And with the love and support from my family and many others, I started the process of change and entered into what I call recovery. So before I went into treatment, I'd manipulated and I'd lied to cover my behaviour and that led, led me to being completely broke, not only financially but emotionally as well. Not having the funding to be able to pay for the treatment I desperately, desperately needed and the weight of what was going on for me was extremely tough and the financial burden of rehab was a huge stress for me. I was ashamed of who I was and how I got to be where I was. And to ask someone for help was an impossibility. But I was encouraged to call the footy club and the past players and ask them for help. Premiership in 1990, 246 games, life member, over 13 years of service uh, with the footy club. They will help you, they said. But because I felt so lowly to myself, I couldn't see why anyone would want to help me. But eventually I swallowed my pride to make the phone call to our past uh, player president of the time, who was Murray Brown. It was one of the hardest phone calls I've ever made, made very simply by the guy on the end of the phone. 
I was still quite unwell, so I cannot recall the exact conversation, but I, what I do know is Murray came and saw me at the rehab and basically said, how much do you need to get through this? I told him what the financial requirements would be for a further three months of rehab, and he said, leave it with me. So Muzz went away, spoke to the AFLPA, who also assisted me financially, and then he was granted resources from our Murray Wiedemann Fund through our past, past play group. That financial support allowed me to start again differently, and I'll be forever grateful for the support that came not only my way that year, but also for the support Nicole received, and also my three children. If I hadn't made that call to Murray, and if Murray wasn't the person he is, and the financial support wasn't there for me back in May 2011, things for me would be very different right now. I'm only standing here today because of the unconditional support I was provided from our past playing group and the Murray Wiedemann Welfare Fund philosophy. So again, I want to public, publicly thank Murray Brown, the Murray Wiedemann um, Welfare Fund, the past players group, Eddie and MO, been a fantastic support back then and now, the footy club as a whole, the AFLPA and their resources for the help and support I was given in what was a very dark time for me and my family. So, it's the morbid, crappy bit. So let's fast forward eight years, and I humbly stand here with an enormous amount of passion and enthusiasm for the role I have been asked to commence as welfare executive. I'll be here to serve all of our past players and our current players that are moving into being a past player. And as the guys have said, no one leaves a footy club high five and that I've just been delisted or I've retired. Doesn't matter what sort of career you've had, um, we're all disappointed and that transition is, can be quite difficult for many. So we're here to, to provide that transition to, uh, and make that a lot smoother. So some of the important responsibilities of the welfare executive role will include, uh, and a lot of these have been mentioned already, but the improved communication and to accelerate the fantastic progress that the current board and the past board have made over the last few years, create better past player networking opportunities, and that will include businesses, increase the membership and our reach to more of our past players, increase the participation in all of our activities, the golf day, the bowls, the luncheons, and add to those, and I'm open for suggestions via email, you've all probably received my emails, uh, we're open to suggestions and we'll be looking at doing very specific match day functions for, for certain groups. And one of the main things is to be able to utilise or fully utilise the extensive resources the AFLPA have to offer that can benefit our past players. So from that survey that Tuddy mentioned recently, uh, at the end of last year, uh, we had a question about the AFLPA um, and what was actually provided by them and whether the, uh, the current past players knew what was provided. And of the guys that responded, 50% of them had no idea what the AFLPA can offer. So I'll be able to help with that and I'll be that, basically that middleman to be able to support our guys uh, with any sort of health or physical, mental, emotional uh, sort of support that's needed. So currently put it up, we've, uh, I've done a lot of list management of late with the lists that we've got. Uh, and our current um, past players list is at 514. Um, and we've already been able to increase um, contact that was 352 emails to about 392. So I've been only doing it for a month and I'm not saying this to pump myself up because I've been on the computer pretty heavily for the last six weeks. It's been quite a daunting task, but I think once we get this list stable and in a position where we can utilise it, we'll be able to really help more guys. So um, that was a key component to start with. Uh, interesting statistic um, of that 514 people, 184 are paid up members. Now our membership's not about making money, but it's about us as past players taking ownership over the group. We've just had a, a, a five year deal for $100. If there's any past players in the room, and I did think uh, Dane Swan was gonna be here, so I was gonna mention him. Uh, but there was about 35 people that were members last year uh, that aren't members this year, and Swan was one of them. So if you know anyone who needs to buy the membership, please call Tali or email me so we can get our membership up and continue this work. So we've got 10 new players. So we've got 10 new players who have joined that have never been um, members before. So it's a really nice statistic to know. Uh, of our 514 players, 248 guys um, are, are members of the AFLPA. And again, that's a really important membership to have. If you played footy 2007 and later, uh, you're an automatic member of the AFLPA. But if you played before 2007, you need to pay a membership. And it's $50 for uh, people who are on a normal income, 
and I think for um, some of the older generations it's 25. So again, that's a really important membership to have because if you have that membership, you can utilise the RFLPA resources. So one of the most other important areas of focus in the future will be post-career planning and retirement transition for the current listed players. And some of those areas include employment and education support, injury and rehabilitation support, and mental health and addiction support services. Before I finish up, I just want to also thank uh, the current past players board uh, that have been in place, and in particular, uh, Port and Paul Tudnam. Uh, they've been instrumental uh, towards this role and the vision of taking our past players organisation to a level that's not ever, that hasn't been seen anywhere. By investing in our past player welfare area and putting in place strategies to holistically support our entire membership base, which will include AFL men, AFL women down the track and also the netball girls, and with a focus of long-term support and assistance, we hope through the work, this work that we can help position the Collingwood Footy Club as the best sporting club for lifetime welfare and in turn assist in player retention and recruiting leverage when drafting prospective players towards our great club. But none of this can happen unless we have input and connection from our past playing group and members. So please, if you have any concerns personally in any area of your life, or you know someone uh, who is struggling in some way, please let me know. So last year we lost a 1990s teammate, uh, his name is Chris Curran, uh, due to mental health and alcohol addiction and then suicide. Uh, so I'm not here to say that we could have saved his life, um, but I think with the, the resources and the, uh, and the commitment of this role, it may have looked differently for him. So I just want to finish with a, a letter, or part of a letter, that Chris's sister Jenny sent me recently. All Chris ever wanted to do since he was very young was play football at the highest level. He was totally obsessed with achieving his dream and through a lot of hard work and dedication over many years, he finally made the grade. When he had retired due to, due to navicular stress fractures at the age of 24 and after only 34 games, it had a devastating effect on him mentally and physically and he never came, overcame the sheer disappointment of never being able to play football again. Initially he was a social drinker but after years of constant pain from his injuries, his drinking increased to the stage where he became alcohol dependent. Eventually it affected his family and working life to the extent where he was doing things that were totally out of character. He tried to conceal his addiction and shunned professional help and advice when it was offered and basically refused to discuss his feelings with family and friends. Chris's depression was getting worse and his drinking was getting out of control. At this stage, he was so good at hiding the truth and disguising his real feelings that we never really knew where he was at, at all mentally. He did seek help for his depression and alcohol problems, going to rehab but came out too quickly for it to really have lasting effect on him. And he slowly went downhill again. His behaviour led him to other addictions other than alcohol, and then when these come to light, he was relieved that he had been caught, as it didn't, look, it didn't like what he was doing. He hated himself as he didn't get any pleasure from doing it but he couldn't stop himself. He then tried to commit suicide for the first time and failed, as he couldn't go through with it in the end. He came to the conclusion that he had to leave Melbourne and start over somewhere else. In his own mind, he couldn't look at his family without feeling judged and thought we were all disappointed in him. People tried reaching out at the beginning, uh, but Chris was so stubborn. He just let them keep calling with no answer and return until they would eventually stop. He did things on his own terms, and would do the same thing to his family. He would call or contact us when he could or felt up to it, as it wasn't always his choice. Depression is really nasty illness. Chris was once asked in rehab, if you could be anyone, who would it be? And his answer was, me 20 years ago when I was playing for Collingwood. <clears throat> over his disappointment of his AFL career coming to an abrupt halt. And we were left wondering what difference the AFL could have made to players like Chris if they had a realistic welfare scheme in place at the time. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. Fantastic, uh, fantastic speech. I've actually read that email myself on multiple occasions and um, it does it brings a it brings a tear to the eye and it sort of chokes you up.